G'day everyone and welcome back to the 39 steps. When we last left off, we had, we were uh, discovered and we were on the run. And we ran into the head of the enemy and they're trying to catch us, kill us and uh, cause all kinds of shenanigans. So, Desperate Measures is the next chapter. In the jaws of the enemy, Hannay's fate appears sealed. The clock is ticking against Hannay in Great Britain. What happens? Well, without further ado, let's find out. Desperate Measures. Friday, 29th of May, 1914. Blackstone Headquarters, Scotland. The whole place smelt of mould and disuse. The old boy had gone off in a motor to collect the two ruffians who had interviewed me yesterday. Now they had seen me as the roadman, and they would, and they would remember me, for I was in the same rig. What was a roadman? doing 20 miles from his beat pursued by the police a question or two would put them on the track probably they hadn't seen Mr. Turnbull probably Marmy too most likely they could link me up with Sir Harry and then the whole thing would be crystal clear the more I thought of it the angrier I grew and I had to get up and move about the room Alright, storeroom. Let's check it out. I could not open the boxes. That was disappointing. Uh, anything else that we can... Alright. Okay. Something else that's... Ooh. I found I found a handle in the wall, which seemed worth investigating. Ooh, ooh, supplies! If only I was MacGyver. Anything else? Uh, four out of four, I think that's it. Okay. Ooh, plastic explosives, is it? It was lentonite, a powerful explosive. I knew from my time as a mining engineer. Excellent collected lentonite. But I had forgotten the proper charge and the right way of preparing it, and I wasn't sure about the timing. I only had a vague notion, too, as to its power. For though I had used it, I had not handled it with my own fingers. But it was a chance. The only possible chance. The remembrance Oh, a little scudder decided me. Ooh, yeah. It was about the beastliest moment of my life, for I am no good in these cold-blooded resolutions. I still managed to break up the pluck and set my teeth 
and choked back the horrid doubts that flooded in on me. I simply shut off my mind and pretended I was doing an experiment as simple as Guy Fawkes fireworks. Okay. Oh. We're out. Demolition Man. My stupor can scarcely have lasted beyond a few seconds. I stepped over the broken lintel and found myself standing in a yard in a dense, acrid fog. I felt very sick and ill, but I could move my limbs and I staggered blindly forward away from the house. Clearly we used far too much of the explosives. A small millade ran in a wooden aqueduct at the other side of the yard. I fell into this. The cool water revived me and I had just enough wits left to think of escape. I squirmed up the lade among the slippery green slime till I reach reached the mill wheel. Then I wriggled through the axle hole into the old mill and tumbled onto a bed of chaff. A nail caught in the seat of my trousers and I, lift, lift, I left a wisp of heather mixture behind me. Nausea shook me and a wheel in my head kept turning while my left shoulder and arm seemed to be stricken with the palsy. I crawled down the broken ladder, scattering chaff behind me to cover my footsteps. I did the same on the mill floor, and on the threshold where the door hung on broken hinges. I slipped across the space, got to the back of the dovecote, and prospected a way of ascent. By the use of jutting out of out jutting stones, gaps in the masonry, and a tough ivy root, I got to the top. I found a space to lie down. Then I proceeded to go off into an old fashioned swoon. New event downward spiral. Alright, that was a pretty f quick chapter. We're going to st dive straight into Downward Spiral. Damaged and intoxicated, Henny escapes the clutches of the Black Stone. But they know he is nearby. Downward Spiral. Saturday, 30th of May, 1914, Blackstone Headquarters, Scotland. I woke with a burning head and the sun glaring in my face. For a long time I lay motionless, for the horrible fumes seemed to have loosened my joints and dulled my brain. There was a little gap in the parapet to which I wriggled and from which I had some sort of prospect of the yard. I saw figures come out a servant with his head bound up, and then a younger man in knickerbockers. I saw the rotund figure of my late captor, and I thought I made out the man with the lisp. I noticed that all had pistols. Not good. They were looking for something and move towards the mill. For half an hour they ransacked the mill. Then they came outside and just stood below the dovecoat. Dovecot, arguing fiercely.
I heard them fiddling with the door of the dovecot, and for one horrid moment I fancied they were coming up. Then they thought better of it and went back to the house. All that long, blistering afternoon, I lay baking on the rooftop. First was my chief torment. My tongue was like a stick. I watched the course of the little stream as it came in from the moor. I would have given a thousand pounds to plunge my face into that. I saw the car speed away with two occupants and a man on a hill pony riding east. I wish them joy of their quest. If that aeroplane came back, the chances were ten to one that I would be discovered. So I thought the uh, so through the afternoon I lay and prayed for the coming darkness on the dovecote. It seemed to me that the sooner I got in touch with the foreign office man, Sir Walter Bullivant, the better. He, mu he must just take or leave my story. And anyway, with him, I would be in better chance than those devilish Germans. I had begun to feel quite kindly towards the British police. My plan was to seek Mr. Turnbull's cottage, recover my garments, and then, and especially Scudder's notebook, then make for the main line and get back to the south. Health. My shoulder was in a bad way. At first I thought it was only a bruise, but it seemed to be swelling, and I had no use of my left arm. I had a crushing headache and felt as sick as a cat. Those lentonite fumes had fairly poisoned me, and the baking hours on the dovecot hadn't helped matters. Appearance. I had neither coat, waistcoat, collar, nor hat. My trousers were badly torn, and my face and hands were black with the explosion. I dare say I had other beauties, for my eyes felt as if they were furiously by the headshot. Okay. Thank God it was a black night. A black night is a long way. Sorry. My thirst was too great to allow me to tarry. So about nine o'clock, so far as I could judge, I started to descend. Halfway down, I heard the back door of the house open and saw a gleam of a lantern against the mill wall. Of course. It appears to be our luck at the moment. For some agonizing minutes I hung by the ivy and prayed whoever it was would not come around by the dovecot. Then the light disappeared and I dropped as softly as I could onto the hard soil of the yard. I crawled on my belly to the lee of a stone dyke till I reached in the lee of a stone dyke till I reached the fringe of trees which surrounded the house. I was in a pretty bad way. Ten minutes later, my face was in the spring, and I was soaking down pints of that blessed water. But I did not stop till I put half a dozen miles between me and that accursed dwelling. I sat down and took stock of my position. Sir Harry's map had given me the lie of the land. All I had to do was to steer a point or two west of southwest to come to the stream where I had met the roadman. I calculated I must be about 18 miles distant, and that meant I could not get there before morning.
a beautiful sunrise on the Scottish moors. <coughs> Very soon after daybreak, I made an attempt to clean myself up in a hill burn and then approached a herd's, co a herd's cottage for I was feeling the need of food. Forgive me. I've taken a pretty bad fall. Come in. Come in. The herd's wife. The Samaritan. Like a true Samaritan, she asked me no question, but gave me a bowl of milk and a dash of whiskey in it, and let me sit for a little by her kitchen fire. She would have bathed my shoulder, but it ached so badly that I would not let her touch it. First impression. She was a decent old body, and a plucky one, for though she got a fright when she saw me, she had an axe handy and would have used it <laughs> on any evildoer. I know what she took f took me for, a reputant burglar perhaps. She showed me how to wrap the plaid around my shoulders. And when I left the cottage, I was a living image of the kind of Scotsman you see in the illustrations to Burns' poems. Please, take this as payment for your hospitality. No, no. Keep your cellar. No! Give it to them that he erect it. Oh, erect then, if you insist. Tack my plead and... Oh, this old heart that belonged to my man. I passed over the miseries of that night among the wet hills. Twice I lost my way, and I had some nasty falls into peat bogs. I had only about ten miles to go as the crow flies, but my mistakes made it near 20. The last bit was complete with set teeth and very light and dizzy, with a very light and dizzy head. But I managed it. In the early dawn, I was knocking on Turnbull's door. That comes stravagin here in the uh. Sabbath morning. My head was swimming so wildly that I could not frame a coherent answer, but he recognized me. Hmm? Ah. Hey, have you got my specs? I fetched them out of my trouser pocket. You'll have come for your jacket and waistcoat. Come on, boy. Wash, man, you're terrible doing to the legs. Hold up till I get you to a cheer. <coughs> I had a good deal of fever in my bones, and the wet night had brought it out while my shoulder and the effects of the fumes combined to make me feel pretty bad. I perceived I was in for a bout of malaria. Before I knew it, Mr. Turnbull was helping me off with my clothes and putting me to bed in one of the two cupboards that lined the kitchen walls. He was a true friend in need, the old roadman. A new event, dry fly fisherman. Wow. It's another one down. I think we'll we're getting close. We probably have what we I think we're gonna do the next episode, which is dry fly fisherman. Turnbull's nursing brings honey back to fighting fitness, but time is running out. June 15, draw near. I think, 
Yes, we might get one, maybe two more episodes out of this. So we'll push on. We'll do one more. And then, uh, yes, we'll see where we're at. Dry Fly Fisherman. It'll be probably the 31st. Oh, Thursday, 11th of June. So we've been here several days. Turnbull's Cottage, Scotland. When my skin was cool again, I found that the bout had more or less cured my shoulder. But it was a badish go, and though I was out of bed in five days, it took me some time to get my legs again. Turnbull went out each morning, leaving me milk for the day and locking the door behind him, and came in in the evenings to sit silent in the chimney corner. Not a soul came near the place, and he never bothered me with a question. He never even sought my name. And let's have a look at the paper. Which is from the 5th of June. Okay. Mm. Anything? Mm. Nothing there. Ah, here we go. King and school children. Letter in reply to birthday congratulations. Oh, very good. Uh, no further trace of aviator. A report circulated yesterday that Mr. Gustav Hamel, the missing airman, had been rescued at sea. Ah, very good. And from private correspondence, the recent outages perpetrated by the suffragettes have aroused such indignation throughout the country. Mm. Trouble brewing. Mm. Huh, there we go. Very good. Uh, anything else? Yeah, there must be something else. One day he produced my belt from a locked lock fast drawer. Here's your belt. There's a terrible heap of silver in it. You better count it to see it's out there. Thank you. But I'm sure there's no need. By the way, could you tell me, has anyone been inquiring after me? Aye, there was a man in a motor car. He speared what I'd taken my place that day, and I let on I thought him daft. But he keep it on at me, and saying I said he might be thinking of my good brother for the cliff that whiles leaned me a horn. He was a worse-looking soul, and I couldn't understand the half of his English tongue. Very good. Thank you, Turnbull. You're a good man. I was getting restless those last days, and as soon as I felt myself fit, I decided to be off. As luck would have it, a drover went past that morning, taking some cattle to Mofat. He was a man named Hislop, a friend of Turnbull's, and he came into his breakfast with us and offered to take me with him. I made Turnbull accept five pounds for my lodging and a hard job I had of it. There never was a more independent being. When I told Turnbull how much I owed him, he grunted something about one good turn deserving another. 
You would have thought from our leave taking that we had parted in disgust. Award, full recovery. Perfect. Driving cattle is a mortally so job, and we took the better part of a day to cover a dozen miles. journey. I had no mind for the summer, and little for Hislop's conversation, for as the fateful 15th of June drew near, I was overweighed with the hopeless difficulties of my enterprise. If I had not had such, if I had not had such an anxious heart, I would have enjoyed that time. The drover. Hislop was a cheery soul, who chatted all the way over the pass and down the sunny vale of Anan. I talked of Galloway markets and sheep prices, and Hibislop made up his mind. I was a pack shepherd from those parts. Whatever that may be. Very good. At Moffat, I got some dinner in a humble public house, then walked the two miles to the junction on the main line. The night express for the south was not due till near midnight, however. So to fill up the time, I went up on the hillside and fell asleep, for the walk had tired me. But all that's... I all but slept too long, and I had to run to the station and catch the train with two minutes to spare. Back on the train, gang. Oh, here we go. We're oh. heading down, coming to London. Oh, no, bletchingly. Oh, oh, hang on, we're going away from London. That's not ideal. Bath. Okay, we're not in London yet. Hmm. About the six, about six o'clock in the evening, a weary and travel-stained being, with a check black and white plaid over his arm, descended at the little station of Artinswell. There were several people on the platform, and I thought I had better wait to ask my way till I was clear of the place. Onwards and upwards. I came to a bridge and fell to whistling. A fisherman had come up from the waterside. He leaned his delicate ten-foot split cane rod against the bridge and looked with me at the water. Clear, isn't it? I back our Kennet any day against the test. Look at that big fellow. Four pounds if it's an ounce. But the evening rise is over, and you can't tempt him. I don't see him. Look, there. A yard from the reeds, just above that stickle. Ah, I've got him now. You might swear he was a black stone. So. Mm. Twisden's the name, isn't it? No. Uh, I mean to say, yes. I had forgotten all about my alias. It's a wise conspirator that knows his own name. Hmm. I stood up and looked at him, at the square cleft jaw and broad-lined 
brow and the firm folds of cheek and began to think that here at last was an ally worth having. Suddenly he frowned. Call it disgraceful. Disgraceful that an able-bodied man like you should dare to beg. You can get a meal from my kitchen, but you'll get no money from me. Evening, Sir Walter. That's my house. Wait five minutes and then go round to the back door. And with that, he left me. At the back door, a grave butler was awaiting me. Come this way, sir. He led me along a passage and up a back staircase to a pleasant bedroom looking towards the river. Sir Walter thought as how uh, Mr. Reggie's things would fit you, sir. He keeps some clothes here before he comes regular on the weekends. There's a bathroom next door and I've prepared hot bath. Dinner in half an hour, sir. You'll hear the gong. The grave being withdrew and I sat down in a shintz covered easy chair and gaped. It was like a pantomime to come suddenly out of beggardom into this orderly comfort. Obviously, Sir Walter believed in me, though why he did I could not guess. I resolved not to puzzle my head, but to take the gifts the gods had provided. I shaved and bathed luxuriously, and got into the dress clothes and clean crackling shirt, which fitted me not so badly. By the time I had finished, the looking glass showed not an unpersonable young man. And here we're going to leave it. Grave news. So Walter Bullivant takes Hanny at his word, but fears Scudder's finding may have been a little off track. Hmm. We'll find out what all that means in the next episode. So thank you very much for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode of The 39 Steps, please remember to leave a like, a thumbs up, all that good stuff. If you're new to the channel and want to see how this concludes in the last, in the final five episodes, or five chapters, sorry, please subscribe and hit the notification icon for this and more. Yes. So anyway, thanks again for joining us. And until next time, laters. <laughs>